Good afternoon. I am so glad you are here to join us today. I am Dr. Rochelle Matthew Somerville, and I am so excited to be here with you today. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, I am one of the high school and special needs consultants here at HSLDA, and I am excited to be joined with one of my colleagues, Mrs. Lanissa James and Mrs. Keisha Berry. And today we will be talking about how to help your child with autism and communication needs, practical tips for home. So let me introduce to you first one of my uh, colleagues here at HSLDA, Mrs. Lanissa James. So Lanissa, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, tell us a little bit about um, your role here at HSLDA and your homeschool family. Who are you homeschooling at home? Thank you, Rochelle. This is exciting to have us all on this Facebook Live. We kind of are going from room to room during this uh, social distancing time of our lives. And I'm really excited. And my first name is Lynn Nisser. My last name is James. I am also one of the high school educational consultants at HSLDA. And I'm a wife, I'm a mother of seven. Uh, the oldest is 22 and the youngest is four. So there's never a dull moment. I've been homeschooling, I guess a, a decade and a half and it has never been uh, a dull moment in our home. I do have five girls and two boys and I'm just so honored to be here with you two amazing ladies because I am just that parent who has experienced special needs. I had at my, my oldest son who is, I believe he's 13 now, did about four years in speech pathology with Children's Hospital. And we're currently doing teletherapy, we'll talk about that later, um, with my eight-year-old son, um, mostly for stuttering. And I'm just excited to be here with both of you guys to learn so much and get tips and ideas so thank you for having me, Rochelle. Absolutely. And we also have Mrs. Keisha Berry uh, from Spectrum. Um, she is a speech and language pathology who has lots and lots of experience with autism as well as other communication needs. And we are happy to have her. Good, uh, good afternoon. Tell us a little bit about your story, Ms. Berry. Hi, um, like Lanissa, I'm so excited to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to share what I can um, with you all. Um, as Rochelle mentioned, I'm a speech language pathologist. I've been practicing for about 10 years. Um, I'm the owner of Spectrum Education and Therapy Center. Um, I, uh, prior to becoming a speech and language pathologist, I was a special education teacher. So at, um, at our practice, we kind of merged the schooling aspect as well as the, uh, the, the homeschooling aspect with the, with the therapy. Um, we work with uh, many homeschool families. That's kind of the population that we, um, that we try to zero in on, merging those two areas. Um, I am a wife and a mother of four. Um, we've been homeschooling, uh, it's been nine years. We've been homeschooling nine years. My oldest uh, is in the 10th grade, he's 15. And then I have a first grader. Um, then I have one who's just about ready to enter school. She's four. And then we have a, a new bundle of joy at home. She's five months. Um, and so I'm just excited to be here and um, you know, help provide information and, and share what I can. Well, thank you. This is, this is a really hot topic right now. And we are we're excited to be here to share um, some information with you all because of course families lives have been turned upside down almost by um, this coronavirus pandemic um, um, and so life as we know it has definitely been changed um, we're all doing things very very differently um, we've had to find a new norm um, what normal is for everybody. But one group, of course, that has been significantly impacted are children with autism and their families, um, as, well as, as well as all of us. But this is one individual group of, 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 of people that have been changed. And so we wanted to designate a little bit of time today just to focus on um, some strategies and some practical tips for families um, and kind of encourage these families to let you know we, we can get through this. And so yeah. 
we are actually here for you. <clears throat> but in addition to not only um, individual families with autism, uh, we're also going to give you some strategies for just those individuals that have some of the similar communication patterns as children with autism. And this may be um, uh, some of the children that present with some of the same type of communication challenges. And this may be stuttering, dyslexia, um, dyscalculia, apraxia, auditory or visual processing disorders. So a lot of times uh, children with um, autism or um, autism spectrum disorders present with those type of ch communication challenges as others. And so um, we want to basically equip you and see how we can, you know, provide you with some in-house during this time where some of those services may look different or be different. Um, a lot of times for these students, um, off, uh, autism is a developmental disorder, of course, that impacts the way that these individuals communicate and interpret their environment and often results in challenges in social interactions and processing information. And it's common for children with autism to be especially challenged when processing change. Now, for the normal person, change is difficult. I've had an extremely difficult time. What about you, Lanissa? How's it going for you? Oh, it's not a dull moment. And when you have a family <laughs> of nine, uh, there's a lot of change going on. You know, we are, we're, we're, we went from homeschooling to schooling at home because we were used to being able to be out and about in our activities, our co-op, our classical, our sports, you know, we're not able to do that. And one of the things that we're doing, uh, we also used to go to face-to-face -face speech pathology with Children's Hospital, and we're not able to do that anymore. And so we were offered an opportunity to do teletherapy, which basically means there's this computer and the speech pathologist comes on the computer and talks to my son. It's a whole hour. So you could imagine, you know, my horror at first to think, okay, my eight-year-old has to sit for eight hours in front of the computer. And normally I'm behind this uh, soundproof booth. And now I won't be behind the soundproof booth. I'm in the room trying to be there, but not be there, not coach him along because normally he can't hear me and I can't correct him. And so we've had a couple of appointments and it is a different, it's different. It's definitely um, a humbling experience. It's challenging. Um, but at the same time, I'm learning ways that I could perhaps help him. Uh, for instance, when uh, he had his teletherapy she was uh, reading a story to him, was asking him, well, what did he think about the story? It was a story about stuttering. And I realized that we had went beyond stuttering and speech pathology into his processing, which is a different issue because it was taking him like, help, help. It was taking my son a while to respond to the question, which had nothing to do with the whole language piece. Oh, you guys got to help me with that. And so then I thought, Oh, what will I do on the next appointment to better support my son? Because remember, I'm just that lay person, that mama bear at home trying to be there for my kid. Do you guys have any response to that, Keisha? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those routines, what I heard you say is those routines are, are, we have all been, our lives have been turned upside down. Those routines are really, really important. Uh, for those of you out there, share your story in the chat box with us. Um, we want to know how your lives have changed due to the corona situation. Um, you know, I, I heard Lanissa mention those evening activities that are, that are now, she has to fill her day with some, some, some in-house things. Um, yeah. uh, Keisha, what are some ways that your kids' daily routines have changed since the arrival of the coronavirus? Well, it's, it's, it, that's a good question. So it's changed um, not only for my children, but also for me professionally, because now everyone is moving to teletherapy. And luckily, um, as a speech language pathologist, uh, Spectrum was already doing teletherapy before the coronavirus came about. So luckily for us, it eliminated us having to learn an entire new system. But, you know, one of the things that we had to do was we really had to support parents, you know, and get them on board with understanding, you know, this is actually possible. Um, you know, your child can do it. Is the first session going to be 100% smooth? Maybe not. But, you know, after a little bit of practice, you'd, you'd be surprised. This, this is a technology age. 
And these kids, you know, they can, they can really, really learn quickly, especially on computer devices. So for me, um, I've, I've definitely been doing a lot more teletherapy than we were, um, but we were at least familiar with it. So it wasn't that, that challenging. Um, as you all mentioned, all of our extracurricular activities are canceled. So I find myself looking at the weather more and more, trying to figure out, is tomorrow going to be a day that they outside? <laughs> so one of my children was like mom I think it's a little cold I said but it's not raining <laughs> so, so we can make a day out of it and so um, definitely you know having to be creative um, with how they can still be productive and how I can you know keep them happy and engaged um, without being able to, to see their friends which is, has been a bit of a challenge sure absolutely what about you Linus or how have your daily routines changed uh, just like Keisha, you know, you are obviously just with your core family. Uh, it's nice to have a big family because they're kind of, they have, they have playmates, but maybe they prefer to play with some of their other friends. So, um, yeah, so we're really trying to make a lot of uh, adjustments to uh, it just being us. And like I said, on the whole conversation about speech pathology, now it's me and my son and, you know, and the, speech pathologist on the computer, which is a lot different. You know, before I could just tune out and sit in this booth and kind of watch her do her thing. Now I have to, like Keisha said, you know, you're looking for, what, what was the word you said? Right. <laughs> like a parent participation, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> so that's new for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but what I heard both of you say is structure. You know, you had to create a new structure. You know, it looks different and, and you might have to create new routines, but you still have some level of structure that you have to create in your house. And this is really, really important for all kids, but particularly for kids with autism, um, because structure is important, routine is important. And so, but um, it doesn't have to necessarily be rigid. You know, sometimes we, we, we think of kids with disabilities as needing that rigid structure. And it's not necessarily that you have to go make that rigid schedule, that's not what they need. Um, uh, structure can simply mean um, where do the Cheerios go when you're finished with the container? Where do they go? Um, having containers where your toys go, um, boundaries, creating predictable situations. Um, what do you do with your clothes once you take them off? Do you drop them in the middle of the floor? Raise your hand if you have any of those kids. Yeah, We're still working on that <laughs> definitely. kind of structure. <laughs> Definitely. You know, um, providing a, a setting clear um, structure can be providing a clear expectation of, of, what you, of what you are expecting a child. And sometimes we don't really consider that to be structure. We, we kind of just assume that kids will learn this, but that is really important to be able to communicate that um, to a lot of students with, with disabilities, particularly autism. Um, communication is simply the act of transferring information or conveying meaning from a person or to a group or another. This can be verbally, non-verbally, written or visual. So there are four different ways to do it. A lot of times we get caught up with the fact that um, communication is only verbal, but that is only one means. So remember that we have four different ways. We have verbal, non-verbal, written or visual. And so before we jump into modes of communication, first, I want you all to uh, jump in there and just share with me different ways that you communicate expectations to your children. Uh, post in the chat room different ways that you, ex uh, that you communicate um, expectations to your children. For me, um, when I was growing up, my mother loved lists, okay? Yes. So I particularly refuse <laughs> to write lists because I'm traumatized by all the lists that used to be posted around my house. Now, it may be effective, but... Uh, we, there were lists everywhere, but that was her way of communicating with us. There were to-do lists here, on the cabinets, in the kitchen, on the bathrooms. Um, so that, that was her way of communicating expectations to us. It, it was clear what she expected. Um, I am more of a verbal uh, kind of person in terms of expecting uh, uh, communicating with my kids, I put expectations on your children. Um, what about you, Lanessa? Yeah, one of the things that I did was when it came down to my son Leo's teletherapy session, 
I knew that he had to be in a place that didn't have distractions mm. because now he was not going to be with a live person. He was going to be on the computer. So I had to move him from, you know, his bedroom or the playroom or any place where there was distractions. And so actually we happened to use this space right here, which I'm actually in my dining room and my living room. And there's just nothing that Leo wants to play with in here. <laughs> so that's kind of where I set him mm -hmm. when the teletherapy came up along with the computer, because I knew he would be less distracted. And so if there's an element of structure when it comes down to his teletherapy, I guess that's probably the, the, the most. But I always try to incorporate fun. So I saw this uh, Facebook post where the woman had the, um, the Nerf gun and the kid was shooting at the different sounds or whatever. So this afternoon, um, you know, we're working on his L sounds which is where, and, and Keisha, you can give me like the, yeah. <laughs> that. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I thought she'd already, we had already printed out uh, a list of words that begin with L, so then he can kind of shoot and say the L, because it's a lot of repetition as, just yeah. from observation, um, and giving him opportunities, um, like you said, Rochelle, in a structured environment to be able to practice, because that's, uh, you know, just from my four years prior, with my son, it's been about 10 years since he was in speech pathology. We're pretty new to my newest son. I knew that the practice was important and the playing games. And I know there's some other people who see speech pathologists out there, post your comments, you know, we wanna hear from you. But I will tell you, I see Johnny, she says, my kids are struggling, you know, by having no spring sports and the struggle is real. We need ways to keep our kids engaged in a way that they enjoy this yeah. Definitely. And I can say too, um, one of the one of the groups that we've especially had to work with our families to help is families of children with autism because and, and let me preface preface everything that I say with, you know, there's a saying that if you work with one child with autism, you've only worked with one child with autism. And that's just Absolutely. all of them, while there are some similarities, um, these students and these children are so special and unique that um, you know, it, it's very important that we look at them as individuals, but from a sort of a global standpoint, um, one way that I had myself set up um, prior to the coronavirus, you know, shutting down basically our way of life was I had a schedule. I had a visual schedule for my kids. Okay, so for my children who weren't readers, I had pictures. So when it was reading time, it was a picture of a book. When it was math time, there was a picture of math symbols. So even my youngest children, know what their expectations were for the day. And it was really built around our extracurricular activities. Um, and so, you know, if we knew we were gonna be out of the, the house half the day on Tuesday, that was a very light schedule. Well, that took a lot of work. And so things shut down pretty quickly, right? And so with, with the, the families of autism that I serve, you know, I said, you weren't given like three weeks notice that this was gonna happen. And I understand that this is very sudden for your child. And I, I'm glad to see in the comments, you know, um, there were comments of using a whiteboard. So that's exactly a, a great strategy. And guess what? If your child has difficulty reading, draw a picture. You know, if the first thing you do in the morning is eat breakfast, you know, draw a picture of a waffle. It's a circle with some squares in it and write waffle next to it, <laughs> you know, and eventually, um, you know, everybody in the household will pick up on what those symbols or what those words mean. But I think definitely, I think for any child, it's important to set expectations. But for children on the autism spectrum, you know, some of them really depend on their daily routines. And so helping them understand that a new one has been created, you know, whether you're typing something, um, you know, we've had families use post-it notes, you know, if, if you know, because there does need to be some flexibility. And, you know, as, as you all know, sometimes your plan just doesn't come to fruition, <laughs> okay? Sometimes yeah. after breakfast, you're not gonna jump right into work and you need to be able to switch this schedule up and we need to go outside for a little bit. And so, you know, making sure you have something that's flexible is definitely something that I would recommend for families. Whiteboards, you can easily erase. Um, you know, post-it notes, you can easily rearrange if you have a child on the autism spectrum that needs a little bit more structure, um, you know, it's, it's something that you know they can stick to and it's not gonna change, go ahead and type up a list. It doesn't need to be fancy. Um, and then Lanessa, you had mentioned making sure, you know, especially with articulation practice, when we're working on how we pronounce words, 
there is a lot of repetition, right? And so we have to think of like really creative ways that we can help, you know, our, our kids practice without getting bored, you know, maybe incorporating it in board games, you know, um, with common board games. And, you know, maybe every time they achieve um, a certain goal in the board game, that's when you practice. Just to add a, a little bit, of, to break out of the monotony of, you know, repeat after me, repeat after me. And that's a, that's a good way to practice and seeing, you know, let's say it's something like putting away the dishes. Every time you put away a knife, it looks like an L. Let's practice our L sound. You know, something, to, something that's already in the routine um, as opposed to having to reinvent the wheel because who knows when we'll be back. You know, I, I think that, you know, there may be a time where one day we all get one of those alerts on our phone to say, hey, back to real life tomorrow. So you don't want to, you don't want to invest a, a ton in, in recreating absolutely everything and definitely give yourself some grace because transitions are hard for us all. But I, you know, for families that have children on the spectrum that are living with them, um, you know, that, that they're raising, you know, transitions, it can be a, a little bit more work. Um, so. I love how you're just using very <laughs> practical things, Keisha, uh, things that you already have around the house. Uh, I watched for many, many years the speech pathology play board games. And I had already been, of course, playing some board games. And I yeah. used to sit behind that soundproof roof and say, I could do this. I could do this. <laughs> but you, you, you mentioned structure. But one of the things is that I really had to schedule in the time to play those board games. Now, keep in mind, these are not family board games, right? right. <laughs> this is just a game, right. you know, that kid and you. So yeah. when you're a family of nine, you are, you really do have to set aside that time. So I, that was probably a biggest adjustment, you guys, to say, yeah. I need to set aside that time, pretend that I'm a speech pathologist, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and, and work with my son in that same setting. And uh, he would go and play shoots and ladders and just all kinds of different yeah. games. And you're right, Keisha, he would, he would uh, the speech pathologist would, once he won, he would say the word. And so, yes. you know, we've got a hundred million things. Going on. <laughs> like, how did she play that game again? And right. how did that game go? You know? mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, I don't know if you have any um, websites or tips or places we can go because I will tell you, I was horrified when she got ready to do the uh, teletherapy because I couldn't find the piece of paper with the, the L sounds that she gave me. So I went on this website, wow. I kind of Googled, you know, right. L words and, yeah. then, you know, he created his own, but it was actually fun because then it was a, she said, tell me, you know, it was like a guessing game. Yeah. Sense? Uh -huh. Where she's uh -huh. like, tell me. And so he's describing one, he was talking. Mm -hmm. And so okay. she, he's describing his word and she had to guess. And then once she guessed, he had to say the word. Oh, uh, okay. It was like an instant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and okay. I was like, oh, that's good. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm always stumped to find new things so I don't bore my son. But yeah, so that's yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah, you know, something that, that may help a lot of families is, you know, kids are actually super creative, right? And a lot of times, if they're able to, you know, I may ask him, hey, can you think of a game that we can play to practice your sounds? And they probably can come up with, <laughs> with a, a game and, you know, the rules to the game, et cetera. And, you know, if you forget the rules and accidentally skip over practice time, they'll remind you, hey, we didn't practice my L sound. So, you know, kids get involved, that's definitely helpful. Um, and then traditional board games, like I said, if you're playing Monopoly or if you're playing Guess Who, you know, Every time you guess a person, let's say the L sound 10 times, or just find ways, um, you know, to, to incorporate that and uh, attach it with achievement. You, you're, you're moving forward in the game and you're making some good progress here. Let's make good progress with your L sound. And then there are different things that you can practice with. You know, some of it is just, I think, becoming really conscious all the times that you actually can practice. For example, think about you know, when, you, when you're walking up the steps. How many steps do you have? Every time your left foot hits a step, let's practice our sound. So there are, you know, really things that you can do without having to be super creative. You just have to force yourself to really incorporate that into, the, into your day. These are really good strategies. And, and I love it because um, I, I love how practical they are because one of the most intimidating things, I think, for parents when they sit or they hear therapy, the word therapy is 
is the fact that they think that these are the professionals and they have all the skill sets and we are the parents and we can't do what therapists can do. And so I love the practical strategies that you are providing. Um, the fact that uh, the parents can do this. Um, you know, I, I hear Lanissa saying that she feels equipped because now watching this teletherapy session, she's watching this board game. I can bring this board game into into my house and I could play this board game and now Keisha's talking about all I got to do is walk up the steps wait a minute we walk up the steps four or five times six seven times a day <laughs> you know so I love it I love it um you know and the other thing too is is that um Johnny I I love the fact that you mentioned family planners um and Christy mentioned whiteboards these are things that a lot of people just have in their house Draw on the picture of the waffle Keisha mentioned. Um, it's not a fancy, most people think, um, when we think of visual supports for kids on the spectrum, we go into the classrooms and you see these elaborate uh, pictures made with board maker program that cost a couple hundred dollars. And you think, yeah. okay, well, you know, that's for the school to do, I can't do that. And so when you start talking about visual supports, you start feeling very intimidated. Oh, well, I can't do that at home, that's for the school. But the reality is, is everybody has a phone. Yeah. Take a picture with your phone <laughs> and print it out. And there is your visual support. You know, if you want, if you want to make a choice board for, for kids that may not talk, um, what's their favorite picture? Or you don't even have to go that far. If you have a favorite waffle, a uh, favorite box of cereal, cut that picture out. And next time you empty that cereal box and you put it on the refrigerator and you put their two, their two um, pictures on there. And next time you want to offer them a choice, you just simply show them the picture. Which one do you want? You know, that's your visuals. Um, you can take pictures and make it personalized or um, take, take actual objects if, they, if they're not at the point where they can actually um, use actual photos um, to they understand the actual representation of photos. Use actual objects. Um, do you want to have cereal? Have a, little, have a little bag of cereal. Ask them, do they want cereal? You want a banana or orange? Actually, have the objects. Um, schedules are great. You all talked about schedules. Timelines. Um, if you have students that are nonverbal and you want to do a schedule, you don't have to do anything fancy. Write it out. You don't have to type it. You don't have to, don't spend 20 minutes typing out and printing out a schedule. Get a piece of paper. Write it. Yeah. Because it may change. Um, and, and we mentioned your schedules change all the time, especially when you have kids. Wonderful. I think Michelle, um, can, you, can you hear? I'm not aside. sure. As soon as we hear it. One of the, we, things, that, one of the things we, that I um I can say is that I have a four-year-old. I don't believe she's on the autism spectrum, but having a four-year-old mm -hmm. is one of those things that require a lot of structure. And um, uh, one of the highlights of our lives is because now we're in we are very, very consistent with her story time, which was maybe once a day. Now it's like two to three times a day. And here was my biggest aha moment. Uh -huh. I sit around and Layla is reading the story. Of course, it's through memory. Mm -hmm. and us, we were all in shock just because of the, like you said, the structure, the consistency of it all. So that was our COVID you know, plus that, hey, now, you know, the girl has memorized this whole book and she's reading it back to us, you know, so it was so fun to see her reading the Dr. Seuss books and Are You My Mother book, but she's mm -hmm. memorized it. Mm -hmm. so that's my little two cent on the four-year-old and also having to pull her away when I need to settle her down. I know, Keisha, you've got little kids too. Yes, you yes. Know, you almost got to separate them because they're they're anxious and they're worked up too during this time seeing everybody home and what's going on tell us what yeah you're yeah so um you know providing the kids structure has been extremely important but what i'm realizing during this time is that i they need some grace like they need the ability, because I don't, I, I think that they, especially the younger ones, they kind of understand why we're, why we're home. Um, but they have a weird way of expressing their emotions, if that makes any sense. I mean, you start to see, you know, some behaviors from the younger kids, maybe a little bit more whining or, um, you know, really starting to express that they miss people. They're asking why they can't go and visit grandma. And so we're finding new ways to help 
um, to help keep them engaged. And it's the same thing with, um, with a lot of our families on the autism spectrum, especially with screen time. So being home um, with screen time and helping families figure out how to manage that and find you know, a healthy balance with learning, there are a ton of resources online, um, almost to the point where it's overwhelming, right? I mean, I could imagine being a family having to pick through these lists where there are hundreds of resources. And so, um, you know, I, I think that my kids have been very involved in figuring out what our day-to-day -day is going to look like. <laughs> right, that's great. Well, that's good. Um... So let's talk, let's talk about a little bit about, um, you all started to talk about teletherapy. So let's yeah. talk a little bit about pre-corona days and therapy services. Mm -hmm. um, therapy services are, were typically given, uh, you know, you had your private therapy, which was basically home health, where you could go into the home and get therapy services, or you had your outpatient where you would go. Lenissa talked a little bit about taking her son to an office or where most kids got their therapy, which was school. Okay, so um, tera 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 uh, teletherapy, excuse me, is not necessarily new, but it's, it's become very popular since we're all kind of structured in the house right now. Mm -hmm. But there are some um, basically prerequisites to being able to access teletherapy. It's definitely not accessible for everybody. Keisha, can you talk a little bit about the prerequisites to accessing teletherapy? Yes, of course. So I think that... Um, most, and I'm going to say families, and I'm using families specifically because when I say that most families can access teletherapy, I'm saying that to suggest that it, there may be um, a lot of children who will need their parent in close proximity, right? Their parent knows how to use the mouse. Their parent knows how to, you know, how to help them click, um, et cetera. But there, there would be some, for a child to participate independently, there would be a few things that we would be looking for. Um, being able to use the mouse uh, is an important skill, but it's not the end-all be-all because there are a lot of um, speech therapy, tele teletherapy websites where it can really just be conversational, me going back and forth um, with the child, whereas there are some programs where speech therapists may share a screen with the family, and then the child is actually doing the clicking and, and managing the software um, on the computer where the therapist can see. Um, but I would definitely, I mean, the first thing would be, you know, being able to sit down and kind of stay at least within the, within the computer's view. Um, recognizing that, you know, the person on the computer screen, I mean, hopefully if you're, if the child is doing teletherapy, this isn't the first time that they're seeing the person <laughs> they're doing it with. But I can imagine in some places where speech therapists are now having to serve many kids in many different places and I mean, it may look different where a child would be sitting down and working with someone they ne they've never seen before. They would need to understand that this is actually a person that you can talk to, right? And so, um, you know, being able to communicate uh, on the screen, um, using the mouse would be something that would be ideal, but not absolutely necessary. Um, being able to speak audibly, speak loud enough so that the, um, so that the speech and language pathologist can hear them. Um, and uh, let's see. I think those would be those would be the the key the key areas. Anything else? I think that there's an aspect in the first couple of sessions. You know how when you start speech therapy, um, in the beginning, what you're doing is you and your therapist are are building rapport, right? So you're learning the way things are going to work. You're learning the way um, that the process is going to going to be. I mean, it's the same thing with therapy. So you know, the child would need to work with the therapist and figure out what it's going to be like. So I would expect the first couple of sessions, um, they're not expected to be perfect, right? Yeah. Applications yeah. that we're teaching you to use the software. Hey, this is how you screen share. Do you see this button? But think about it. When I'm talking to you about screen sharing, I'm working on listening comprehension. I'm working on following directions. So there's a lot in learning a new skill that are the basic um, foundations of language that can actually count towards therapy when we're teaching to use the software. So I think there's an aspect of come with what you have, but also come as you are. And then it's our role to help bring you up to the point where, you know, we can have some really effective therapy sessions. I love that. Yeah, I had to encourage Leo to um, look into the camera. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was kind of like this and... <laughs> 
this. And I kept saying, hon, you know, clicking that little button. <laughs> she said, no, you're looking at her. And he was like, oh, you know, so it does. I love what you said, Keisha. It does take a while for them to understand this new normal of how they're going to do teletherapy. But yeah, mm -hmm. that point was pretty funny. <laughs> he was looking all over the place. Right. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Or if you're out there watching and you have any experiences with teletherapy, um, tell us about your experiences. If you have any questions or um, share your story about how you're receiving therapy since the, since, um, the coronavirus has come. Um, are, you, are you receiving therapy? Has it completely stopped? How are you, how are you addressing those therapy goals? Um, share with us. Share with us your thoughts. So, Lanissa, as a parent, are there any anxieties? that come with changing from a face-to-face -face rather um, re uh, as opposed to a uh, teletherapy? Oh, absolutely. Because it's different when you're just kind of carrying your kid into a facility that someone else is going to do the work. <laughs> you know, okay. like, oh, I'm just here and, you know, I'm just waiting in the waiting room. You know, I happen to be behind a soundproof booth, but now I don't have that luxury I obviously have to be participatory in a very direct way in that I, I literally am in therapy too. <laughs> I'm sitting the whole time, you know, making sure that, you know, my son is paying attention and um, I actually have this note, literally I have this, you know, this dream book that I hold and I'm sitting, you know, back just taking notes and you know, when I think about it, I just want to read to you my uh, sure. therapy page. I have a teletherapy page in my book because I was thinking to myself, I, now I have to be participatory with the speech pathologist to follow up on what she's begun as opposed to when I was bringing him, it was her job to kind of keep that continuing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, kept, it said, uh, reading stories out loud, comprehension from oral, oral reading which was not, you know, she didn't, she didn't do so much. They were doing more games when we were going to um, the hospital for the therapy appointments. And now I was being more conscious to the fact that she was going to be reading my son oral stories, you know, mm -hmm. and asking him questions. And so my thought was, is that speech pathology? I was like, okay, that's a different right. department. And so mm -hmm. I was thinking to myself, man, I really have to um, be conscious and, and, and work with him on his reading comprehension. I was, making sure he's um, responding and answering the question. Um, so yeah, so you kind of, my pendulum, my cheese has been, has been moved now that we are home, you know, doing teletherapy. Mm -hmm. Well, outside of your therapy sessions, how do you incorporate practicing speech? Um, are there, is there a way that you um, merge those goals into your social, into your social routines or your daily yeah. routines? I'm trying, you know, we're all in this, you know, pandemic and we're all trying to make progress while we're, you know, going through crisis. And so I will tell you, we usually do therapy once a week and they've been pretty quick weeks coming around. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, you know how you anticipate that next thing that you're going to do sure. to prepare for your therapy and you look up and you're like, it's today. <laughs> so yeah, you really have to schedule it in. And so we're, we're trying to get uh, more intentional uh, with the things that I need to do that's different from his homeschool education, but it's kind of, it's called preparing for teletherapy. How about that? Okay. I gave it the name. I I like the, name. the things that we need to do to prepare for our, our, our uh, teletherapy appointment. Um, but yeah, that, it, it has been changed for us. And so we're adjusting. It's a work in progress. Well, Keisha, do you have any recommendations of, um, as a speech and language pathologist of how you would recommend that parents um, would actually practice those speech goals in a natural set in a natural situation or um, throughout the day, like in, yeah, a, in so, the home? Yeah, so absolutely. And I just want to back up um, to your question when you asked uh, Lanissa if there was some anxiety associated with teletherapy for, for parents. One of the things that we do, uh, we recognize that this just seems... It, it may even seem impossible in some situations, especially when working with children with autism, where, you know, what we're doing is very hands-on, you know, there's a lot of behavioral support that we're providing. So a lot of what we do is really prepare our parents. Like we, we call them and we talk to them individually and ask them to really give themselves reasonable expectations, you know, and say, listen, this is what I expect the first session. 
I expect that we'll probably spend at least 15 minutes just trying to get, you know, trying to get the kid to, to sit in front of the computer and that's okay. But you know what? If he gets up five times this time, next session, let's see if we can get to three, right? So it's really helping yeah. set expectations and say, let's, you know, this is brand new. Um, it's hard enough for us to sit. Um, so, so let's try to be as reasonable um, as possible. But then things about, um, you know, strategies for incorporating speech therapy practice and communication practice, because um, just to make the distinction for myself, so when we're talking about speech, we're talking about articulation um, and the pronunciation of words. When we're talking about language, we're talking about comprehension and receptive language and expressive language. Um, and when we're talking about communication, we're, communication is very, very broad, right? And so one thing that I think that is extremely important for um, families of children with autism is ways to build communication throughout the day, which if you think about it, there's so much that can be done. For example, um, and, and a lot of it has to do with being intentional, right? So for our, for our children who um, tend to be less verbal, I don't necessarily want to say, say non-verbal, but those who are less verbal, and even those who don't use words, um, you know, things like, you know, when you're making a bowl of cereal in the morning, intentionally not giving a spoon, right? And then letting your child, you know, look at you, you know, eye contact, that's, that's a way of initiating, like, hey, mom, <laughs> I think you forgot something, or hey, dad, I think you forgot something, um, or when it's time to go outside, giving them only one shoe, and then just waiting yeah. and seeing what they're, see if they'll reach, because reaching is a form of communication. It's a form of nonverbal communication, or let's say a child who you may be giving them their cell phone to give them a, a little bit of a break, and they can play an app on the cell phone, giving them the cell phone, but not putting in the password. See if they give it back to you. You know, so a lot of it is just really being conscious of all of the opportunities that you have to communicate um, throughout the day. Um, when working on, you know, if you, if you have a child that can sit down and do a, a workbook or a, a full speech and language activity, I mean, there are those resources that are out there, but there are so many opportunities, you know, just throughout the day, you know, to work on communication. And really a lot of it, what I tell, what I tell families is, you need to spend your day intentionally creating problems for your child, right? Because when you create problems, then they have to communicate or they'll have to think. And so really trying to be conscious of that and how you can do that and be creative. Um, you'll, you'll be surprised at, at how creative you can be as a parent because your child needs you a lot. <laughs> I love that. These are I great ideas. This is amazing. I see Johnny said she uh saves time because she no longer has the 45 minute drive each way hey i'm in that group I yeah <laughs> not having the drive and then um christy also remembers having that whole intimidation feeling too about working you know homework from the therapist that's yeah. always tough and then i see my friend tanya on here when she says she just had her daughter's first appointment via the phone that's oh. cool. Mm -hmm. And they mentioned that they're going to move to video conferencing. And that's intimidating for parents, you know. Yeah. Also, can we just kind of plug in there that we kind of maybe have to clean the house a little bit? Because <laughs> yeah. Yeah. people now are seeing inside your house. Yeah. Right, right, you're really right. Taking your kid out, right? It's yeah. Serious. Right. I see in the comments that uh, Christy made a comment, too, about um, one of the things that's intimidating may be that um, the fear that, that she, as a parent, has to do it right. And that, con that concept is always an interesting one because the reality is, is that if you are the parent, you want to do the best for your child. And so there is no doing it wrong. You have to remember that as a parent, um, when you're trying to, to, to serve your child and you're doing the best you can, there is no doing it right. I mean, you know, when, you, when we take them to a therapist, they're doing the best they can. You know, yeah. as mom, you're doing the best you can. So whatever we do, you know, we're like magicians. Uh, that's what I always say. I said, we as my parents are like magicians. As homeschool moms, we are like magicians. We're just going to keep pulling things out the hat until we can figure out what works. It's the same thing. It's the same thing with therapists. We're going to keep trying different things until it works. There's no magic. I'm not suggesting that there's a magic, um, a magic grape in the, in the hat. I'm just simply saying that we're going to keep moving until we find out what works. And so that concept of that concept of right is is one that kind of makes all of us panic. But rest assured that we all are in the same boat in terms of getting it right. 
but rest assured that as long as you are trying to, to serve your child, you are getting it right. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you, I just want to piggyback on that because I can tell you that when a, when a child walks into, into a clinic or when we're meeting a child for the first time, we don't come in there with a perfect plan. I mean, and, and we probably, I mean, from a therapist standpoint, therapists may be intimidated by, you know, meeting new clients and new families and, oh, I hope the parent doesn't, you know, think I don't know what I'm doing because the child is upset now. And so I think that, you know, there definitely parents want to get it right. Therapists want to get it right. And I think what's most important is that we work together. Um, we place a lot of emphasis on viewing our parents as partners. I always phrase it um, by telling my parents, I may be the expert in speech and language pathology, but you're the expert on your child and I cannot do it without you. So I really, really depend on my parents to, you know, if they see I'm doing something that their child really, really doesn't like, or, you know, if I'm offering stickers and, you know, my parents says, you know, if you would give him that Spider-Man sticker over there, you could get him to do anything. Those things are extremely important. So it really is a partnership. And we, guess what? We appreciate parents to just do the homework. Right. And if you can't, if you can't, I mean, that, that's honest. And, you know, sometimes I ask my parents, listen, tell me honestly how much time you have to do homework. Because I can plan for that. If you can do an hour every day, great. If you can do 30 minutes a week, great. If you can't do anything, great. But just tell me and then we can plan. You know, we can try to plan around that or, or, or I can come up with strategies or ways to support you. Because like I said, there are probably more opportunities throughout the day that you have to practice than you think. But you're thinking that we have to carve out, you know, a nice quiet time and sit away and I have to get all my other kids settled, et cetera, um, where what you may need is actually some strategies so that you can actually practice in what you're already doing. That's good. That's good. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here she says uh, her kids are grown and doing well, but HSLDA has been very beneficial part of her homeschool. And at this time, the U.S. as a whole is homeschooling. We're all homeschooling. <laughs> we need so many of these practical tips that you guys are sharing. And so it's helping the world. So thank you, ladies, for being on this uh, live. This is awesome. Yeah. I'm learning so many ideas. I'm going to end so I can write. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, going back to a little bit to the, to, the, to the strategies that Keisha was given before, um, and the examples that she was given. Um, I love the examples that she was given because sometimes, even for, even for all of our kids, what we need to do is give them a little bit of motivation. Um, and so I love the examples that she was given because <clears throat> motivation is really, really important. A lot of times when people call me, they're saying, oh, my kid will only do things when he or she wants to do them. And basically what they're saying is they need to be motivated. And so if you give them motivation, you know, not mm -hmm. putting in that code for that iPad when they want it, that's yeah. motivation or, you know, not unzipping the Cheerio bag, that's motivation. Yeah. Um, you know, we just got to put those hats on differently. Um, I, I love it. That motivation piece is, is one of those key strategies to getting, um, getting uh, students to communicate. But also modeling communication is something that we don't think about, but we do regularly when you interact with your um, other student, uh, your other kids, or you interact with your husband or other people, yeah. your mother or your other people in your household, or you talk on the phone, you are modeling communication. And this is really important for people on the spectrum um, because yeah. although a lot of times they can't give it back in that moment, that modeling is really, really important because a lot of times um, kids are watching, kids are watching and, and young adults. Um, uh, but they may not be able to give it back in the moment that you, that you want them to. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Rochelle, you said something that I learned when I went to take my son to the speech pathologist was not to be in this whole corrective mode mm -hmm. with words, but to model. And that was a, an adjustment for me. And so um, instead of saying, you know, you said lid wrong, I would just repeat the word and say, and if he said ill, or live, and he didn't say lid, I, I just would say it the right way, which is modeling, as opposed to correcting him. And I will tell you, my husband and I struggled in this area. Yeah. We had the wrong thought about speech pathology as to yeah. what we should be doing. And so now it's a lot of repetition, or Rochelle gave the professional word. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. well, yeah, we were 
Well, you know what? And, and, I, and I say all the time, we are all on this journey together in homeschooling. We really, really are. I mean, as much as I have taught my kids, I have learned just as much along the way. I mean, it looks very, very different. As I explore curriculums, I learn as much as they have learned through the curriculum. Um, you know, as I have explored strategies that learns uh, strategies to work with this child, I have learned more about something else. And so we as parents are as much um, on a journey through this homeschooling process or schooling through the situation. And so all of this, I hope has equipped you all um, with, you've taken away something just a little bit with that, that ha has made you feel a little bit more equipped than um, you felt before, because we are all doing an amazing job. You are doing an amazing job. I appreciate you, Lanista, for sharing your individual stories. Um, Keisha, you have been an amazing and given an amazing perspective from a speech and language pathologist and a mom, um, a mother of little ones and older ones. Is there any resource, Lanista, um, that you have used for communication or speech or any game or anything that you think that you have found particularly useful that you can leave our members with that you can share um, as a mom that you've used with either one of your sons. But before I ask you, if you as a, as a uh, member that are watching us out here can think of anything that you have used maybe in the past or you're currently using now as a resource for your child that you think is helpful for anybody that's watching, drop it in the chat box for us and share. And just let us know what, what you found uh, to be helpful. Um, well, well, Mr. can you think of anything? Well, I can kind of close with this. I was pretty desperate before that teletherapy appointment, and I just Googled something like mm -hmm. words, and some website came up where it just had a list similar to the sheet that I had gotten at the speech, you know, at the speech pathologist's office that I had misplaced. So uh, as soon as I find it, I'll put it in the chat. But I just literally Googled, you know, um, L words because I know I needed a whole bunch of different pictures. And so the words, you know, it actually had pictures on it. So for us parents who are trying to figure it out, that's an idea. You can kind of Google what it is that you want to do. And maybe there's something out there that will uh, give you a model or a visual. I love what you're saying. If you want to put visuals up, you can kind of Google some and then print it out. And uh, before I say goodbye, I just want to throw something out that's wonderful for the, the viewers, is that these two amazing ladies are sisters. <laughs> they yes. are, oh, <laughs> I, I couldn't let this go without saying <laughs> that um, they are sisters um, from the Matthews family. And congratulations to your mother, who has a total of, you have six kids and you have four? Yes. <laughs> she has 10 homeschool kids. I yeah. aspire to have <laughs> 10 homeschool grandkids. Isn't that exciting? Yes. But um, thank you for being a part of this. You guys are both amazing. I always learn so much from being with you guys. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. So any last final thoughts, um, Keisha, that could encourage any strategies, any last tips that you could share with the, with the members? Yeah, there's so much out there, but particularly for the autism community, I want to share two resources that I think will be very helpful for families that they can kind of research on their own. Um, one is a website called News to You. Okay, so it's in the letter N as in nest, to the number, and Y as in you, <laughs> like Y O U. So n2y.com. There are a ton of resources on that website. And you, it's across multiple levels, so multiple levels of language learners. Um, it's a great opportunity to practice comprehension, um, to review current events. It's a ton of resources, and you can even log on and get some free samples. The other thing is Teacher Pay Teachers actually has a lot of free resources on there, and a lot of speech and language pathologists have posted some free resources on there for families to access. So in the search bar, and this is teacherspayteachers.com, in the search bar, you could type, you know, speech therapy language or speech therapy articulation practice and, and some really good resources might come up. So those two things would be very, very helpful, but especially news to you. Those of you that are homeschooling, um, children on the autism spectrum, um, news to you, they cover a variety of subject areas and it's, it's very supportive. 
Um, and so I think it would be, it, it would be very helpful for families. Okay. And Keisha, we're going to have you drop those in the comment section okay. just so okay. we can, just so, just so everybody can have those um, in case they missed them. And okay. also we're going to ask you to drop your contact information in there just so they can have your information in the case that you want to contact um, Keisha uh, for awesome. some, for some more information um, in terms of her support services and things. And I just want to leave you with one resource as a parent of a student with a disability. And this is just one, re this is one resource by Sally Clarkson. This, um, it's a book called Different, which is just a really encouraging book for parents. Um, if you have a learner with a special need, really, really encouraging story written by a mother and her son. Um, this is the kind of book that you start and you absolutely can't put down. So I highly, highly, highly recommend it. It's called Different by Sally Clarkson. And also, we also have a resource list for you of, um, of communication apps to support uh, your students that we will also drop in the, in the um, comments, I'm sorry, in the chat. And so we will drop that in there for you. So if we don't do it, we will have it in to you momentarily. So we have most appreciated you all being here. Thank you very, very much, Lanissa and Keisha. And you all have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful evening. All right. Take Thank care. you very Bye. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye for now. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.